Hi, it's Jessica DeMasa with WTF Health. Thanks for joining us. I'm doing a special series on how different health technology companies and businesses from around the world are responding to COVID-19. And so joining us right now, we have a friend from Italy. This is Roberto Ascione. He is the CEO of Healthware. So Roberto, it is such a pleasure to have you with us on the ground in Italy. Tell us where you are, first of all. Hi, Jessica. Thank you for having me. I'm, uh, yeah, connected from home as everyone else in Italy. Uh, and I'm uh, today connected from the south of Italy uh, around the Amalfi Coast. Okay. Well, give us an update on what's going on there. I mean, you are somebody who has, you're a doctor, you've got your start in infectious disease and have gone on from there to have a, a career. And, and most people probably know you from Frontiers Health or from the work that you do through Healthware with different pharmaceutical companies in terms of helping them, you know, build and source different startups with digital solutions. So, I mean, I want to catch up with you on what's happening in digital health in Italy. But before we get there, I mean, give us kind of a you know, a word on the street here. What's, what's happening in Italy right now? I and mean, what are you guys hearing and seeing from the healthcare system, from the people that you're working with on a daily basis? Like for those of us in the U.S., you know, give us an update. Yeah, and I mean, the, the, this, is, this is a big deal. Uh, there's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, a, it's, it's a tragedy in many, in many regards. Uh, it's something that uh, you maybe study, you know, on, 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 on the books when you think about, you know, this, this big, you know, uh, pandemic and epidemiology, but it's, a, of course, a completely different thing to be right in the middle of it. And, um, of course, you know, we, we, we work in digital health, and, and so we are, like, uh, um, not fighting kind of first line or maybe also, but in a way, but, of course, you know, our friends... Uh, doctors, nurses uh, that are really fighting uh, night and day, nonstop in hospitals. Uh, those are the real ones that are holding, you know, stronger than anyone else. Yeah. And then the, the whole population behind, because we are in total lockdown as of now, a couple of weeks. Uh, and I say, when I say total lockdown, I mean the entire country. Uh, it's 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 complete lockdown, rightfully, because. Uh, what it's clear uh, through our experience is that uh, complete lockdown, hopefully augmented by certain digital initiatives, which I'm sure we'll talk later about, um, it's probably the best kind of path uh, through this and to overcome this, uh, this, this big issue. So right now we are in this situation. The North, uh, as you see in the media, uh, is struggling uh, uh, much more, unfortunately. Um, the south regions of the country are relatively less impacted uh, so far. And that's why lockdown is so important, because it's important not to allow this to spread at the same speed uh, uh, towards the south uh, as well. Um, so that's, you know, pretty much, uh, pretty much the situation. We are starting to see a little bit of... Uh, um, a little bit less steep curve over the last few days, Good. but it's, it's, it's way early to say it's over. So we are, you know, through it and it's super important to keep all these lockdown measures uh, very strict uh, for the foreseeable future. Yeah. So real, real quick, I want to run through a couple of things with you just to, to kind of compare notes from what we're seeing here in the U.S. Obviously, we're a few weeks behind you guys. I'm talking to you. It's Thursday, March 26 here. Um, and, I, you know, so I'm curious, like, how are things going with testing? That's still a big issue here in the U.S. Are you hearing anything about, you know, the, the different, are you guys able to deploy tests as quickly as you want to? What's happening there? Yeah, there, there, there's a big debate about, uh, about this. Uh, Italy is uh, following the WHO recommendations about testing, which have been uh, kind of adapted over time. So we, uh, when we started, we started with uh, uh, testing those that had symptoms and had an epidemiologic connection with the, the uh, regional you know, uh, epicenter in China. Then this has been uh, uh, modified into broader uh, testing. Um, so right now there is a, a fair amount of testing, but there is a debate whether more people should be, should be tested. Okay. Uh, the key thing is, uh, there is for sure a ratio, uh, between those that are known to be positive and those that are truly positive in the population. Um, and there's discussion whether this ratio is one to five or one to 10. 
Um, there are different studies, so some recent one, it's even uh, uh, making some hypotheses around 1 to 20. I think probably 1 to 10 is a fair uh, assessment uh, of, the, of the situation. So probably um, an expansion of the testing would be um, you know, good um, to have a better uh, picture of the situation. Um, but already now you can probably say that uh, the ratio of people with the, um, the infection is probably one to 10 to those uh, tested. At least this is what I hear the most. Okay. What else are you hearing from the front lines in the hospitals? I mean, we've been talking, I mean, everywhere around the world, this is no surprise to any of us who work in any aspect of healthcare, overburdened health system. So give us a sense of what's happening in Italy. What are you hearing from the front line there? I mean, uh, public health here, uh, it's extremely good. Uh, our national health system, it's one of the top in the world. Uh, and even the people that work in the system, I'm talking about doctors, nurses, um, are extremely, not only professional, but they are uh, loaded with uh, uh, and really extra, uh, you know, charge of overcome, you know, this kind of extremely challenging situations. And they, there are a lot of them that are being, uh, that have been infected as well. Um, and despite that, you have people that are recovered and then went back, you know, to yeah. the front uh, to fight this as uh, they, they are saying. So this is really amazing, the reaction uh, that the system is having. The issue is that when you have, uh, um, in, in, in the most challenging cases, it's all about the ability and the capacity that you have in terms of providing intensive care and ventilation. Mm -hmm. um, so the real issue is that when the, there's a too high peak and so those beds are saturated uh, and you are working at capacity or above capacity, there is where basically you start to struggle. And in order to fight this um, uh, new, basically, uh, uh, words have been converted to COVID words in hospitals. New spaces have been opened. Uh, and also, um, a number of different initiatives have been put in place to augment the capacity to provide, uh, to provide ventilation. Um, so we are kind of coping with it, fighting hard, uh, holding really strong. Uh, but the key is really to have a you know less steep as possible curve as basically the infection spread you know spreads out and this is basically what countries that have been able to observe italy which is the first western country with a comparable you know health system and and government model and social model um basically that has been hit um there's a lot of learnings that you can build yeah. on Italy over there these last four weeks, um, which I see that are being probably partially followed. Um, if you look at the uh, not so fast, probably, you know, way lockdown is being deployed. Um, yeah. And I'd also think the other risk is the expectations. This is not a two weeks thing. This is a. Um, so yeah, I was going to ask you then. about that. You know, I mean, we've got President Trump saying we'll be back to work by Easter. You know, and here you guys are. You know, four weeks ahead of us. What what kind of of information are you getting from your government in terms of the timing? Uh, nobody knows yet, yeah. uh, uh, for sure. Fair but, enough. <laughs> yeah, but I think the um, it's safe to think that there are probably more. I mean, my personal opinion is that probably safe to say there are four more weeks of comparable lockdown, maybe six. But then, you know, it's all about how this evolve with the immune response. And so what, you know, how this will, uh, to predict how this will evolve. Do we need more lockdown? Do we need maybe lockdown by areas? Um, there are some like pulsed lockdown schemes that are also being discussed. Uh, but certainly I don't think it's a two weeks thing, uh, okay. to be honest. And then what are you finding out about patients who have had the, who have been infected, who've, who've recovered? Is there any, is there any takeaways from there as people are starting to come out of the other side of this? Now, to, to be honest, I don't have uh, uh, information about that or heard nothing, but I also don't think those patients, there is capacity to study those patients uh, deeply uh, as of yet, because there's still, uh, you know, the peak of the emergency to fight. And you need to, of course, assist those that are in critical conditions. Okay. Um, I think the, um, 
<clears throat> immediately after, and especially through digital, uh, we should be able though to monitor better and to observe, you know, longitudinally, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, how the population um, will, what will be the, you know, kind of population dynamics about that. But I don't think there is. Uh, uh, much data as of yet about this. Well, let's talk about this digitally for a minute because I do want to want to get you know a, a, an idea from you of what's happening with digital health in Italy and Europe as as you guys are, are you know tackling this virus as well. And so we in the U.S., you know, it's like we're looking at digital solutions, telehealth solutions, digital therapeutics to help keep people out of the hospital or help remote monitor things like that. Same things. So give us a sense of what's happening there. And I mean, you're coming at this for those who may not be familiar with. Healthware. I mean, Healthware is it's a it's a big organization. I mean, you have part, partly you do work with different pharmaceutical companies. So I'd love to hear a little bit about what's happening there. But also, you have a you're you're an investment fund as well, and you work with startups, and you have a couple startups in your portfolio. One of which is a telehealth company. Uh, so tell me a little bit about that side first. I guess what's happening that you guys are working on directly? Yeah. So first off, as this started now a month ago. Uh, we built um, an integrated crisis team within the company, and this crisis team has been in touch with our clients and partners um, and is teaming up with them uh, to help, first in Italy, and now is expanding to other countries, unfortunately, um, to help with uh, um, d d helping them to cope with the situation as well, um, which largely relies on the much wider and deep adoption of digital tools uh, in order to, uh, you know, enable remote working, uh, uh, remote collaboration, also think about uh, uh, scientific teams uh, and, and anything that can facilitate, you know, the response to the emergency and to the research. Yeah. So that's on one side. Okay. On the other side, we basically started to team up with the startup companies of our portfolio um, to see what we could have done to respond to the emergency, right? Mm -hmm. So, and I can tell you that um, I think it's fair to say that we are doing in Italy um, 10 years of digital health evolution in 10 days. This is really um, crazy to say, but I, I, I'll, I'll give you some data that kind of really uh, goes in this direction. Um, so to, to, give you, to, to give you an idea about that, um, we teamed up with this startup called Pagine Medica. Uh, mm -hmm. This is basically a digital health platform that connects patients and, and physicians. So during the first days, um, there was a big need for information and education. So the first reaction um, these guys developed with even our support um, a chatbot to triage symptoms and help people to understand better and do self-assessment. Um, so in doing this, what basically happened is this chatbot was built, was out in the field like 72 hours after the emergency started, so super early, and we have been donating and keep donating this chatbot to any hospital, any government uh, institution, Great. that basically requested for it. How's the uptake been? What has the response been? The response has been great. So first off, I've been happy to see that uh, uh, government has been able in few days to validate, to do all their uh, due diligence scientifically and embed on many of their websites. So this was a super easy, uh, privacy conscious, totally anonymous, uh, self-triage chatbot, easy to integrate on websites. Okay. So it was designed on purpose to be fast response, right? And this has been in place now since uh, already some time. And there are, you know, over at the last count, over 70,000 people that wow. have self-triaged. And all these data have been uh, recorded and made available to a task force of the Ministry of Innovation in the country that has been created uh, around basically a data-driven initiative uh, to take better decisions. Okay. Um, those data are now in the process of being also donated to the WHO uh, that requested for uh, to contribute to their own data initiative. And these are full triages with self-reported symptoms, body temperature, and so on, so forth, geolocalized okay. uh, throughout the country. 
So it sounds um, like lots of public way, support for that, for getting that data, for getting that deployed quickly. Yeah, and uh, so that's why I said, you know, there's been this huge leapfrog because, you know, government has been able to quickly uh, adopt, deploy on several sites. More sites are taking on this so that more channels are contributing to, you know, accrue more data. Um, and it's been designed in a way that doesn't concern with uh, GDPR and privacy because it's fully, uh, you know, uh, anonymous. And so it's helping really to have meaningful, uh, meaningful data points. Okay. So that's, that has been the first basically response. And then in keep working with these guys at Pagina Medica, um, they were providing as a normal business video consultation, right, between patients and, and, uh, and, and doctors and remote disease management. So um, as any other telehealth platform, of course, patients were able to book their own visits, but this was not effective for the emergency because right. if you think a situation like this, uh, physicians would have been inundated by requests. So they've been amazing in uh, hacking their own solution. And what they basically did, uh, they turned the uh, uh, basically uh, 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 user experience upside down, allowing the physicians to invite patients based on needs. Uh, okay. So that through this, they are reducing the exposure because they are not seeing the patients face to face, but you know, through video, through of course. Video. Mm -hmm. um, this happened, um, I can give you some data points which are very interesting, yeah, happened, happened 10 days ago, uh, has been made available for free to any doctors in the country, and in basically less than 10 days, uh, more than 1,300 doctors registered uh, and started to perform video consultations. Fantastic. And these are huge numbers for the country, which was much you know, behind in terms of uh, you know, teleconsultation or video consultation adoption. And as we are speaking now, they are reporting data that there's a new video consultation that starts every other minute, which oh, wow. is you know, great. Um, so that has been second line of response. Good. And the third and very interesting, uh, which went live only two days ago, um, as now big part of the game is to monitor patients that are positive and are stayed at home because they have uh, either little symptoms or they can, or they have maybe not even no symptoms at all, right? Mm -hmm. um, the key is to monitor those people in distance because you need to keep the hospitals that are already at capacity free for those more kind of, you know, challenging cases, right? Yes. For emergencies. Mm -hmm. So they've been adding on top of the self-triage and the video consultation, a disease management module for the COVID positive patients where either the patients, you know, themselves or their caregivers every day can report symptoms, body temperature, uh, saturation of oxygen, so that the physicians that have them in charge from remote have a dashboard to basically check how you know their patients are doing and intervene or alert the emergency right uh, uh basically ahead of time right and this is where you will win the battle because if the ratio is really one to ten as we all think um for those that are in the hospital there's this large population at home that needs to be taken care of and so I'm happy to report that in the last, in the first day of operation, already the first 60 patients have been enrolled and started to, man, to be managed from home. So I think this is incredible if you think, because they put all this together in less than two weeks, uh, free to everyone. And we are extremely proud of, uh, all no, of them. That's amazing. That's absolutely amazing. And I think, I mean, I'm listening to you talk and I'm thinking to myself like, oh my gosh, there's so much for us in the U.S. here who are, you know, like four weeks behind basically all, of all of the things that you've done and implemented to learn from you. So it's, it's just, it's wonderful to talk to you and to hear how you have managed through this and how some of these um, digital health companies, telehealth companies are pivoting to meet the needs of, of what's going on there as, as they're unfolding. I mean, there's a lot for us to learn. Um, on that data piece of it, as you guys are collecting this stuff, are people able to partner up with you on this? Like, so for example, if there is out there a startup or a big health system or somebody who's watching this right now and they want to, you know, find out how they can, how they can kind of mirror what you're doing or learn from what you're doing. Like, is there any, I mean, maybe it's, sorry to put you on the spot and ask, but it's like, are you willing, can we, can, how can we share all of this information? 
Yeah, no, there are, there are two things that, that we are helping uh, the guys at Pagin Medica to do. So the first one is that the platform is being made available to any uh, physician, group of physician, physician network or hospital that wants to adopt and several already are doing as we speak. Okay. Gover- government has also opened a call for startups that have a response to different topics, including this. And of course, these guys have responded. So I hope that next week, um, the Ministry of Health will basically help to spread this initiative to anyone through their own official channels. But I think it's interesting to say that we started with them regardless in a way, you know? The system was built, physicians started to use, and word of mouth, you know, and reach out one physician to the other has been, you know, already, you know, uh, uh, total, uh, as I said, the 1,300, you know, uh, physicians that are that are using this, um, so I hope that the next iteration will be government uh, kind of you know adopting this and spreading even more. Okay. Because uh, I, I think it's 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 you know the usage uh, the key to this thing is the usage. You know, is this something simple enough for physicians that maybe are not used to the system to kind of you know uh, take on and use it kind of immediately, and for patients at home to do the same. Yeah. We now have a huge proof of concept that is true. So now next step is really to spread the distributions. So that's, that's basically one of the next steps. Um, data, uh, both the WHO and a couple of universities that have you know, strong data science uh, capabilities are teaming up with our, our own data scientists to look into this data and find if there's anything okay. uh, interesting there. Um, Keep us posted, please. <laughs> yeah, no, that's for sure. I'm, 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 we'll find you somebody at either like Google or um, Apple to work with on, on and, ta- and taking that to the next level. <laughs> yeah, and as you can see, I'm, I'm taking a little bit of a diary on LinkedIn about, you know, this thing yeah. uh, uh, so that I'm trying to make everyone aware about this initiative. The other thing that probably is worth uh, mentioning is that the chatbot has been made available in a number of languages okay. through voluntary translation. Um, so you know, we will publish uh, a page to apply to that, uh, you know, in the coming days. And of course, there are a lot of startups in around the world that are already in the, you know, uh, kind of conversational, you know, digital health space, Mm -hmm. uh, which have deployed their own uh, things. And that's great. Um, What's special to this initiative is that this is a super fast to deploy web based, totally anonymous. So it's super easy to embed onto any website and feed this data set that is growing behind the scenes and donated to you know, research institutions. Uh, so I think that's probably part of that. So sure. in, in a couple of days, uh, the first languages will be available, starting from English, Spanish, French, German, Portuguese. So will be you know, made available around. Okay. Well, Roberto, thank you so much for letting us chat with you and letting us visit you while you were in your self-isolation there in Italy and, and hear about what's going on, not only, you know, in the healthcare system, you know, what you're picking up, you know, anecdotally word on the street, but also what you guys are working on there at Healthware. So it's, a, it's a, been a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. No, I mean, we are all in this together. We were hoping that this stayed the Chinese-Italian thing, uh, but unfortunately, you know, it's not. Um, the only thing we can do as a global community of digital health, you know, people is really to mobilize as we have been doing in Italy. And there's, you know, a, a lot of technology all around the world. Um, so I think it's uh, incredibly important that in a cohesive, focused, probably even organized way, but we come up with whatever we can put in place for the institutions to fight this thing. Because digital can do so much, uh, given, given the specific conditions, given, given how the, uh, this pandemic is spreading, it's probably something that, as much as drugs, digital health can contribute just probably in the same way. 
Roberto, thank you so much. Thank you so much again for your time. I'm Jessica Damasa. That's thank Roberto you. Ascione from Healthware reporting to us from uh, the Amalfi Coast in Italy. Uh, and we thank him for his time. If you'd like to check out more of these video interviews with um, health leaders from around the world, um, and in, specifically in health technology, digital health, and telehealth, as they're working on helping the healthcare system combat COVID-19, please check out my YouTube channel. It is youtube.com slash WTF health. I'm Jessica Damasa. Thanks so much for joining us. See you soon.